on the rabbit. Rabbit. Ah, uh, now, what did you just say? I hold it, the rabbit. Uh, so the children are really sure that this is the right way to, this is the right way to say it. Um, then there's this really fun stage where if the kids kind of get the idea that there are both of these roles, but they sort of think, well, the same thing to do is I'll just use both of them. So they'll say things like, I ate it, the cookies. Um, so they kind of got the eight in there, and they got the ED role in there, and they figure one or the other of them is going to turn out to be right. Um, and then finally, the children get it right, and they say, I ate the cookies. But notice that they're getting it right is just getting back to where they were when they started. Yep. Uh, yeah, so what you see is you see all the regularization happening in different languages, but it depends on what the language structure is like. So, for example, in a language like Russian, um, you have a very, very complicated series of what are called declensions. There's a language like you know, Latin, if any of you've ever tried to learn Latin, or, or even French or Spanish, there's a million different endings that you're supposed to uh, it, uh, put on nouns, for example, to make them mean different things. And in languages that are like that, children show the same sort of over-regularizations, not for the past tense, but for, uh, for things like nouns, right? Exactly, for nouns or declensions. Now, it's an interesting question about languages actually like Mandarin, um, because languages like Chinese don't use very much of this morpho morphological inflection. So you don't see the over-regularizations showing up as much, because there isn't all that much of that inflection to, to learn. But then the babies do other weird things. So again, the babies will do other weird things that are sort of weird things that reflect the way that they're understanding it. Uh, but that's a good point. Uh, so what I've been talking about so far is really just talking about babies learning English, and you see similar phenomena but different stages if you're looking at babies learning other kinds of languages. Um, so the, there's a couple of really interesting things about this pattern of over regularization. One of them is that this developmental pattern is one we'll talk about later. It's called a U-shaped curve because it's a case where the baby seems to it's like a, like a U. You get things right to begin with, then you get worse, and then you get better again. And that happens fairly often in development. Um, and it's always really interesting when it does because you want to know well, it's easy to explain why you might start out getting things right and get better, but why would you start out being better and then get worse? And it's also interesting because it goes against what you might intuitively think are some of the most obvious explanations for why children might uh, start to learn language. So you might think, for instance, that children learn language by imitating what they hear other people say, but they never hear anything say I eat the cookies and they definitely don't ever hear anybody say I ate the cookies and nevertheless very regularly very consistently children are producing uh, these kinds of forms um, another sort of intuitive idea you might have is well babies learn children learn how to speak because they're reinforced for saying the right thing positively and then they get negative reinforcement for saying the wrong thing but as that example I gave you about I hold the cookies works um, no one ever is going to think that you're right to say I eat the cookies in fact uh, if you were correcting the child you'd say no no it's not I eat it I ate but that doesn't seem to make any difference to the development of these regularizations um, you know what I think I'll do? I think I was going to have an explanation break after I explained over regularization, but I think it'll actually be better to do it before I explain over regularization. So now let's have an explanation break. I just said how puzzling this is, and what you think of a reason that you could give to explain why it is that we see this weird phenomenon, and then we'll talk about the reasons that I, I which I suspect you will get to, uh, about why it is that children never regularize after the explanation break. But let's take three minutes to do that. I mentioned this uh, initially, but just so you know, with the midterm, you'll be getting the essay questions a week in advance. So you'll be getting them on Wednesday, and I'll talk about how the midterm exam is going to take place on, on Wednesday, and there also will be a review for the midterm um, next Monday at 7 o'clock. So uh, we'll send out an email about it. It'll, it won't be in this room, it'll be in Evans, but next Monday at 7 o'clock, and that will be basically open office hours. So we won't be preparing anything, but you can come with any questions or problems or issues that you have. Okay, so you'll definitely uh, you'll be getting the midterm exam essay questions on Wednesday, and I'll talk about, a little bit about the format and the ideas and how to answer them then as well. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, any explanations for over regularization? Maybe somebody thinks they've got an idea? Somebody must have had an idea. Um, uh, uh, sorry, people here. Uh, an idea for an explanation for over regulation. Because everybody was just talking about the last episode of Girls for that. So. Yeah. Um, so let's be like, uh, that maybe children here are locking here, they'll teach these rules in other systems and then try to simply apply them to their own 
Yeah, exactly. So the typical explanation that we have for over-regularization is that the children aren't just trying to find particular sentences, and they're not just trying to even try to communicate. There are rules in language, and the children seem to be very sensitive to trying to find data that will tell them about those rules. So the children seem to be looking, actively looking for patterns and rules and using those in their own language, as opposed to just reproducing exactly the language that they hear other people around them uh, produce. And that actually makes a lot of sense, because if you think about language, almost all of the sentences that you both hear and say are actually going to be sentences that you've never heard before and never said before. So to be able to use language, what you really need is a system of rules, not just a system of particular examples. Okay, so that's and the last episode of Girls was pretty good, too. Okay. Um, Okay, so now we've got the babies, now they're not babies anymore, now they're getting to be four or five year olds, um, and they're starting to put together those, so we started out by saying that when they're back in the telegraphy stage, they're missing these inflections and function words and auxiliaries. Overregularization is about how the children start at least mastering some of the inflection, some of those uh, uh, morphological endings, but when children do start putting in those extra words, start putting in the extra uh, auxiliaries and words, articles and function words, um, it's, a, it's actually a really important problem about how to put those words together in order to have more complicated syntactic structures. Um, and again, just as in the case of overregularization, what you see is that children go through these gradual stages in which they often demonstrate things that look like U-shaped curves as they work out what these, how these more complex syntactic rules work. And one of the classic examples of that is if you look at what's called negation. And negation is simply about how you make a sentence mean the opposite of what it actually means. So negating a sentence means you take the sentence and you just say, uh, it's not the case that the sentence is right. Um, and what you can see is that when children, and so if you look at the way we do that as adults, it's actually pretty complicated. So if I want to tell you the opposite of I ate the cookies, I can't just say I ate the cookies, not, right? Um, or I can say that, but that's not the standard way that I'm going to say it, right? Um, what I'm actually going to say is something like I didn't eat the cookies. And if you think about it, that's a really complicated way of switching around the meaning of I ate the cookies. Uh, it means that I have to insert this new word, do, and I have to add the form of not that goes with that particular word, um, and I have to change the tense of the verb. It's a pretty complicated operation. And when we watch children learning, what we can see is that they kind of get parts of those operations in pieces. So to begin with, for instance, the kids really do say something that sounds like I ate the cookies not, uh, except that usually what they do is just put the word no at the beginning of the sentence. So they'll say something like, no, I eat the cookies, um, to say that they didn't eat the cookies. Uh, then later on, they seem to get the fact that no doesn't actually work for negation in English at all. We don't ever put no in a sentence to make it mean the opposite. The word that we use in English is not, and not is another one of those mysterious little function words that doesn't quite have an obvious meaning, but just serves to go in and change the meaning of other words. Uh, and the second thing that children seem to realize, so they seem to realize it's not about no, it's about not, and the second thing they seem to realize is that you have to insert that negative word in the middle of the sentence. And you can't just insert it anywhere in the middle of the sentence. You have, in English, you actually have to put it right before the verb. So you can't just say, not I eat the cookies, that won't work either. You have to put that negative form in a particular spot in the sentence, and that particular spot is right before the verb. So children seem to get the principle that the negation has to go right before the verb, um, and they also seem to get the idea that the right word for that is not and not no. So then they'll say things like, I not eat the cookies, but it's even more complicated than that in English because you can't, for reasons that are completely mystifying, um, you can't just put not in. You actually have to use this other strange function word, do, and say, I do not eat the cookies. Um, uh, and again, children seem to get the idea that you have to insert do in there somehow. You have to combine the do and the not um, because they'll say things like, I don't eat the cookies. Uh, but what they, uh, what they still haven't got yet is that it isn't enough to just put the, uh, uh, sorry, let me, I'll back up for a minute. There's some evidence that when they say that, they really seem to think that don't is just a separate word. They don't realize that don't actually is a combination of do and not. So it's as if they think, okay, I can say a no to mediation, I can say not to mediation, or I can say don't to mediation. But they don't seem to realize that don't is really this combination of do and not. Um, and then finally, they start to recognize that don't actually can be pulled apart into do and not. And they also seem to recognize that when you negate a sentence, you actually have to put the, um, the, the tense onto this auxiliary, the don't, rather than putting it on the verb itself. So if I'm just saying, I ate the cookies, I turn eat into ate, which is the past tense. Everybody talks about that, like, linguistic, it's very complicated. Just the simplest versions of it. That's up your head. Okay, so I ate the cookies is what you say, but when you want to do the negation and you want to say the opposite, what you have to do is put that past tense on that do instead of putting it on the verb. And now the verb is going to be in present tense. So you say, I didn't eat the cookies, even though you say, I ate the cookies. Oh, sorry, you say, I didn't eat the cookies. Negation, even though you say, I ate the cookies in a positive sense. Has everybody sort of got their heads around that? Okay. So think about how much that is screwing up your head as a 20 to 57 year old, which is probably the range of people in the, in the class. Four year olds seem to have no trouble with it, right? So somehow four year olds are figuring out this incredibly complicated set of combinations and permutations and insertions that need to be able to do something as simple as say, no, I didn't eat the cookies. Yeah? Uh, question, that also really has a problem. Um, well, what I noticed from my experience when you ask them, hmm, so you don't want to go too far? And they say yes. Yeah. Right. They like one, so you do or you don't. Uh -huh. Yeah. They just say yes as in the statement that you just said. Right, right exactly. Right. Is, is that part of this whole thing? Yeah, I mean, well, so again, if you just think about that example, so why is it that when someone says you don't want to go to the park and you say yes, that's the wrong answer, right? It seems like that should be the right answer. That is the true thing about what it is you're doing. But when you say so you don't want to go to the park, you have to say no instead. So exactly what happens is that figuring out negation in, in English especially is just, it's really, really complicated. And there are rules, irregularities, if you look more closely, but they're not at all obvious rules or regularities. So that's a good example. And kids are saying that it's just about the same time that they're mastering this uh, negation in their, in their language, in their complex syntax. Uh, and again, the remarkable thing is that the children are making these mistakes, so it isn't as if it's just all unfolding automatically. And the fact that they're making the mistakes in this order suggests that they're actively trying to do something to figure this system out. But it's still amazing that by the time they're five, they figured out something that's as complicated as that. Um, and finally, let me give you uh, another example of the same thing. Suppose you take a positive uh, sentence now, and instead of turning it into a negation, you want to just turn it into a question. So now I want to ask uh, uh, whether I can eat the cookie or not. Again, what babies do to begin with, maybe it's some, there's something funny about the fact that babies in like, valley talk seem to be similar. So what babies do to begin with is say, I eat the cookie. Um, they actually don't do it with quite that intonation. It's more like, I eat the cookie. Um, but what they initially do is just put their voices up at the end of the sentence to indicate that they're asking a question. Like, I eat the cookie. Um, I, 
Then what they do is, just as they do the negation, they'll take one of these question words, like when, and just stick it on the beginning of the sentence. So they'll say something like, when I eat the cookie. Um, and then they'll start taking some of these weird auxiliary words, like can, is the one that's relevant to question, and inserting them into the sentence. So they'll say things like, when I can eat the cookie. And again, why it's really puzzling about why that's wrong, even though we all know that it's wrong. Um, and then finally, they get the principle that you actually have to put that auxiliary word, in this case, not before the verb, but before the subject, um, to say, when can I eat the cookie. Um, so the main point about these examples is to just give you a sense of how complicated and difficult that even just saying very, very simple things like I didn't eat the cookies or when can I eat the cookies. Exactly how complicated the operations and rules are that children have to figure out to say even very simple things like that. And yet again, as I say, by the time children are five, they're saying and understanding sentences like this completely smoothly and easily and spontaneously. And next time what we're going to do is talk about some of the explanations that people have proposed about how it is that they managed to do that.